Welcome to the Ease Workshop Series. We are here to help you succeed. We want to provide you with foundation skills that many students struggle with. If at any point you need more time to answer a question or to process the information, pause the video until you are ready to continue. This video will go over what metrics are, how to convert between systems, as well as units, and how to most efficiently represent your numbers in a robust fashion. As you move along through the presentation, if you are answering the assessment questions, answer in accordance to what has been taught in the presentation. For example, if you need to input a numerical answer, but we haven't covered scientific notation yet, then just go ahead and input the number that you get. As I move forward, you can take advantage of the reference sheet found in the link you see on the screen. Before we can talk about metrics, we need to figure out what it is. The most simple definition is that it is a standard of measurement. For example, the use of temperature, mass, and length. But perhaps it can even be expanded into new realms. So why do we even need metrics? Well, there's a couple of reasons. They are a means of comparison. For example, the size of a house mouse at 15 grams or half an ounce versus an elephant at 5,500 kilograms or also 12,000 pounds. There are a variety of different metrics depending on what we are referring to. For example, if we think about money, what type of currency you're juicing. If you are old enough to drink alcohol, you know, do you take your alcohol on ounces or you look at pints? Uh, when it comes to buying a good computer, you want to look at how much computer memory or what is the capacity of that computer, right? And then you also have medicine because you want to make sure that you're not taking too much or too little of the medicine that was prescribed to you. Lastly, they are largely used in science to take measurements of length, mass, time, temperature, and even more. However, there is a problem when it comes to metrics. The U.S. uses an English system of measurement, while the rest of the world, including the scientific community, uses the metric system. The table here shows the units of measurement utilized in both systems. In the U.S. system, one gallon equals four quarts, eight pints, 16 cups, 128 ounces, or 3.8 liters. In the English system, there is no noticeable relationship between inches, feet, and miles. But the metric system is in centimeters, meters, and kilometers, all based on meters, with the relationship that is easily visualized, like in this number line shown here. Money is the only English unit that is base 10, like the metric system. So let's think about this. What happens if you read a recipe in Fahrenheit, but it's really listed as Celsius? If this results in a cooler oven, nothing will cook. If it's hotter, you can end up with bread looking like this, slightly raw in the center and burned on the outside. What about if you use too much or too little of an ingredient? If you were given a European recipe but read it in American, it can drastically change the results of your food. And even if you don't like baking, baking is important to everyone because you either like doing it yourself or you like consuming the product of it. So that is an example of why it is important to pay attention to unit conversion. But worry no more, there is a solution to this problem. Essentially, the scientists within the U.S. ignore the national system and join the rest of the world in metrics. This allows a universal system between disciplines, as well as geographic regions. And even if we were to manage to get the entire country to switch over, we still need to know how to convert between the U.S. system and the metric system to at least transition. So, no using four-letter words like inch, foot, yard, mile, pint, acre. Please keep it clean and metric. To convert between systems, we will go through how to use the fraction method. There are other methods out there if this doesn't work for you. For the question, how many centimeters are in 3.56 inches? 
you first write the initial or given value. Then we find the relationship using the conversion table below and write it as a fraction. You put the given units, which are in this case inches, on the bottom of the fraction and the wanted units on the top. Notice that the relationship says approximate. You can use either relationship to do the problem, but you may see different results in the final answer. Both answers would be acceptable, but you have to specify which one you use. The next step cancels out the inches, leaving us with the desired conversion to centimeters. Then we do the math and we end up with 8.9 centimeters in 3.56 inches. I just want to give you an example of why it is so important to both convert units correctly, but also indicate which units your numbers are in. The Mars Climate Orbiter was sent out in 1998, but on September 23rd of 1999, communication with the spacecraft was lost. This is because the ground-based computer software produced output in pounds per second instead of the contract-specified metric unit of newton per second. As a result, the spacecraft encountered Mars on a trajectory that brought it too close to the planet causing it to pass through the upper atmosphere and disintegrate instantly. Now that's an expensive mistake. If you're sticking with the universal system, you won't need to convert between systems, but may still need to convert with regards to magnitude. This is much easier because it works in multiples of 10. All we have to do is move the decimal place. That said, you should become familiar with these prefixes. Mega and micro are three steps from their neighbor that I show right here. The remainder are one step from each other. If you are not familiar with these prefixes, they can be tricky to keep track of. So mnemonics are often helpful. The first letter of each unit size makes the first letter of each word. Here are a few different ones so you can pick which one will help you remember the most. Kangaroos hopping down big driveways carrying M&Ms. Well, that's a funny sight. King Henry doesn't usually drink chocolate milk. Kids have dropped dead converting metrics. Probably so. Kiss her daily because divorce costs money. Or at least it can't hurt. And kittens hate dogs but do chase mice. Pick whichever one works best for you and go with it. Now that you have basic understanding of the prefixes and their relationship, let's go over how to convert across magnitude. Keep in mind, if you are going from a bigger unit to a smaller unit, the number will be bigger than the original number, and vice versa. Small unit, big number, big unit, small number. Think of this way, a single $100 bill is a large unit and has $100. $1 bills. Conversely, a single penny is only one-tenth a value of a dime. Again, all you have to do is figure out which direction and how far to move the decimal place. For example, how many kilograms are in 3.2 milligrams? First, ask which direction you need to move the decimal place. We are going from small unit to a large unit, so to the left. Next, we determine how far to move the decimal place. Start in milli and move one, two, three, four, five, six steps. That results in a smaller number. 3.2 milligrams has 0 0.0000032 kilograms, or 3.2 times 10 to the negative six kilograms. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to pay attention to the units, not just the base unit like before with pounds versus newtons, but also with something as simple as teaspoons versus milliliters. Take this as an example. A baby was given five times the prescribed dose of Sanex syrup, a medication for reducing stomach acid production, until a doctor pointed out the error a month later. Fortunately, the child was not injured, although doctors say there was a risk of seizures or stroke had this incorrect dosing continued. The doctor prescribed a dose of 0.75 milliliters twice a day, but the pharmacist labeled the bottle give three-fourth teaspoons twice a day. A teaspoon is about 
five mLs. A similar problem could have occurred if the units were left off altogether. So remember before when I had two forms of the same number written down? The one with the 10 to the power is called scientific notation. We'll briefly go over this because it will come to play in a minute when I discuss significant figures. We use this as a way to handle very small or very large numbers and to avoid the difficulty in saying, reading, or transposing the values. The standard form is to have a single digit number, a decimal place, then all of the other numbers with a 10 to a power of times indicating the magnitude. A positive exponent means the number is large. The 7 shown here lets us know that we are in the multi-millions. Opposite to this, a negative exponent means the number was small. The negative 4 means we are in the thousandth place. A few real-life examples when scientific notation is helpful are if we were looking at the global population, rather than writing out 7 billion, we can just say 7 times 10 to the 9th. Or, for the size of a computer hard drive that is 4 gigabytes, it's 4 times 10 to the 9th, rather than writing out the number of bytes. Now, we don't want to have our numbers after the decimal to run on and on. That is when the concepts of accuracy, precision, and uncertainty come in. Accuracy is how close a given measurement is to the actual or known value. To determine accuracy, we have to have a reference standard value which we can compare our measurements to. Related to that is precision, which takes into account how close are the measurement values to each other. This is independent of accuracy, which you'll see with a graphic in a minute. Let us look at the relationship of accuracy and precision a bit more. Picture a target and you are ready to throw some darts. How would your darts look if you have high accuracy and high precision? Hopefully, you pictured something like this. Now we're going to do this slightly different. Look at the targets with the darts. How accurate or precise are they? If you need to pause the video, you can do so at this time. This is what your answer would look like. Let's look at this real life example when it comes to accuracy and precision. Let's talk about car manufacturers, which have to be both accurate and precise. If you see somebody with a car and decide that that is the car of your dreams, that is the car you want. When you buy it, you expect that the one you purchase will be exactly like the one you saw. Thus, car to car, must be very precise. Then, when it comes to conforming to US Department of Transportation Safety Standards, they have to be very accurate. Lastly, we have uncertainty. Uncertainty can be expressed with a range of values, a plus or minus. There are many types of uncertainty, including average deviation and range, but we'll focus on two other ones, the first being the variance which is the average of the square difference of each value from the mean. So take a look at this image. What you would do is that you would take the difference of each value, which is shown in the red lines, from the mean, which is the green line, and then you would square it. Then divide it by the number of measurements, which in this case is 5. The standard deviation measures how spread out the values are from each other. It is calculated by obtaining the square root of the variance. Now our last topic, significant figures or significant digits. To think about this, let's answer this question. Is it possible to have an exact measurement of anything? Well, if you think about it, no. There is always error as a result of the device we choose to measure with. We can always have smaller and smaller divisions, but at some point it becomes impractical and the last digit is always a guess or the last digit is an uncertain figure. If you take a look at the top ruler, there is only a little space for uncertainty, 
when it comes to the 2.55 value, but there is more uncertainty when you just have a 2.5. This means that any given number always has an assumed error of reliability, which we indicate with the use of significant figures. For example, 13.2 has two significant figures, 13.23 has four significant figures. But what if there's a zero involved? It gets a little trickier, but it's fairly intuitive. So to decide significant figures, any non-zero is counted as significant. Zeros in the middle of non-zeros are always counted. If a zero is to the left of a number, they do not count since they are just placeholders rather than indications of uncertainty. Related to that, any zeros to the right of the decimal place do count. But when a number ends in zero with no decimal place, we can't determine certainty. For example, 190 miles could be two or three significant figures, and 50,600 can be three, four, or five significant figures. What can we do to avoid this problem? I'll give you a hint. You just learned about it in this workshop. You are correct. You can use scientific notation. That forces there to be a decimal place and thus lets an outsider know how certain you are of the value. The last thing we need to go over is dealing with calculations with varying levels of significant digits and uncertain figures. For multiplication and division, the final value is dependent on the fewest significant digits of the operator. For example, we have two significant figures times four significant figures, so our final answer has to be only two significant figures. The exception to this rule is if the calculation results in a leading one, when no ones were in the original problem. In that case, we keep the extra digit. So if you look at the problem here, 3.7 times 2.8, giving us a 10.4 versus 3.7 times 2.8 times 1.6, resulting in 17. For addition and subtraction, the answer can only have one uncertain figure. So if you look at the example set here, 153 plus 1.8 plus 9.16, we have three uncertain figures. So we would round it to only one uncertain figure. If you encounter a problem that uses both multiplication, division, and addition and subtraction, you follow the order of operation. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, which basically means parentheses, exponent, multiplication, and division, then addition and subtraction. After doing each step, if the next step is the same operation group, don't round yet. But if it is a new group, you are switching from multiplication to addition, then round before you complete the next step. So if an answer needs to be rounded to reflect the correct number of significant figures or digits, here are some rules. If the digit to the right of what you need is from zero to four, the number stays the same. And if it is from five to nine, it goes up one with one exception. If the first and only digit dropped is five, then you round to the nearest even digit. So 2.315 and 2.325 both round to 3.32 because 315 is closer to 32 than it is to 30 and 325 is closer to 32 than it is to 34. Case in point, if you purchase a house for 150K at an interest rate of 3.94% versus 3.9% per year over the course of 30 years, that's a difference of $1,239, which could be invested to gain even more money or in a good trip with your family. That wraps it up for metrics. You survived, and so just remember, no using four-letter words. Thank you for listening.